Okay, so welcome back. We have been looking at visual impairments. So we've looked at the different kinds of um, difficulties that children can have with their vision. And we've looked at a whole variety of things that can go wrong with the eyes and given you an, eye, an indication of some of the things to look out for. I want to speak now about some of the influences that having a visual impairment has on a child's development. So our eyes are a very important sense for us to be able, for us to use in our development of our physical being, our understanding of space, um, our motor skills and our integration between our senses and our motor skills are all combined. And we have done some speaking about this. So visual impairments, children who have visual impairments, we know that it will have an impact on their physical and their motor development. It's going to have difficult, they're going to have difficulty with integrating what they see in the world around them and perceiving all of the, the things. So it's uh, a visual impairment compromises a person's development as they go through the developmental stages. So we know when we've when people have studied children who have visual impairments that their physical and motor skills are often delayed. They're not progressing at the same rate as children without these um, difficulties. So we also know that they will start to rely on their other senses, sense of touch and auditory senses. And often children with visual impairments are um, not moving around as much as their um, peers who are not visually impaired. So because a little baby is not moving and crawling and exploring the world as much as they should, they don't develop the same control over their head and their neck and their um, trunk and their posture as what a child with um, adequate visual functioning would do. We also know that they can have difficulties with establishing directionality and laterality. So I've spoken to you before about laterality. We've got two sides of the body and we've got um, two hemispheres of the brain crossing over and we have a midline. So we need to be able to use both sides of our body and we need to be able to um, know where, our where we are in space and which direction we're following. And so there are lots of things that are going to be compromised when a person's field of vision is damaged or when they have some kind of acuity problems with their vision. So they're not going to develop the same um, gross motor and fine motor skills as a child who has um, adequate vision. So the, 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 the tempo, the pace at which the child is developing will um, uh, the, 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 the rate of the motor maturation of the physical development skills will often um, be, be, be compromised. It will be less. So they will not reach their milestones. So children, um, little babies, when they're developing, they've got various things which we call milestones that have to be um, put in place. So they have to be able to raise their head, to sit up at a certain age, to pull themselves up uh, on some furniture, to stand up at a certain age, to be able to walk at a certain age. It's, these are key milestones in development that happen if there is adequate vision and motor feedback and the child is developing adequately. So if any of those um, if any of the vision is compromised, the physical milestones are often delayed and it can be an indication 
that there is difficulty with the child developing vision, visual motor integration together. The other area that is compromised often is perceptual development. And we had unit two, we spoke a lot about perception. And we know that perception takes place in the brain. So you have the stimulation coming in from all your senses. And we had a whole lecture on the senses. And you have to integrate all the information. You have to make meaning of what is coming in so that the brain can understand the world that we live in. So if there is any kind of compromise to the visual system, to the eyes that are receiving this information, they're not seeing the world clearly, they're only seeing parts of it, it's blurred, all of that will have an influence on the perceptual development. So children who are partially sighted will experience problems with visual perception. They're unable to organize. They're unable to see clearly. Um, and you can just think of color blindness, how that can have an influ influence on your ability to see reds and greens and yellows. Um, and so any of those things in your world are compromised. So we know that children who are blind will start developing far more of their auditory perception. So the ears become much more important as a skill to be able to, um, to hear. So the, the hearing becomes very, very sensitive and they're able to use that as a sense to compensate for the inadequate vision that, that, that is there. But we also need to teach listening skills. So we need to teach children to listen accurately and purposefully and deliberately. They, it is not something that will just automatically happen. Um, so teachers and parents will be taught to um, uh, tell children, listen to me, I'm talking to you listen to this part, don't listen to the background. So that thing, whole idea of we, we also need to develop the skills um, in order to be aware. And we also know that blind children often have problems with time and spatial awareness because these are abstract concepts and they're abstract concepts which we discover as we are living in a world where the sun comes up and lights our day and then the sun starts to go down and the day starts to get darker. So if you are blind and you're unable to see this light, day, light, night thing happening, it often has um, uh, implications for your ability to understand um, uh, time and, and the progression of the day and the hours and so on. I know um, children who um, are blind will often, and, and who have some residual light um, senses that, that can sense some kind of light, will be, um, will think if, if there's a thunderstorm and the day is getting dark, they will think that it is Either they are the, 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 the day is shorter or they will sometimes think that their vision is getting far worse. So they get um, they're fearful because the, the vision is deteriorating. And so the, the more darkness you start to see, the, uh, the more trauma it causes us for the person. Obviously, we, we know that it's very hard to be um, a blind person. OK, so. Understand that time, space, perceptual, everything to do with how you perceive the world is going to be compromised. The other area that we know um, will have some kind of difficulty is language and cognitive development. And vision plays an important role in your, your understanding of language um, because we understand language not only through our ears, 
but also through our eyes. We are looking at people's facial expressions, at their gestures, at their lips, when we are trying to make sense of what they are saying all the time. So children who are blind or partially sighted are disadvantaged because they're not able to see a situation in its totality very quickly and um, quickly make a sum of what's happening. So often abstract language um, can be delayed and so this will also need to be taught, um, overtly taught. And um, we will often use words which blind people do not have a clear understanding of. So if you talk about pink and if you talk about um, this is light or dark, when you're referring to um, different shades of colors, for instance, the, uh, a person who is partially sighted might not have a clear understanding of what we mean by all of those terms. So often they, there's words in the vocabulary we have, but the person who's visually impaired hasn't got a clear sense of what that word actually means and what and, and a clear understanding of it. So we know that physical development is affected, milestones are affected, perceptual development is affected, language and cognitive development. And we also know that social and emotional development is affected um, of learners who have any kind of visual impairment. So we are learning our social skills. We're learning to interact with people by the cues that we get from everybody. And we pick up a lot of our cues from um, people's, um, from looking at people. So we pick up a lot of our culture and our interpersonal relationships from what is happening around us. And this can be very difficult for visually impaired people to, to do. The other um, problem that people with, with any kinds of impairments often will, will um, encounter is that the rest of the world doesn't know how to deal with impairments. So the attitude of other people towards people with disabilities often comes into play here. So um, it's very difficult and one has to be aware of someone who has a visual impairment, who's in your um, classroom or in your social circle or in your environment. You have to be consciously aware of their needs and their difficulties and what they, what they require. Um, and so some people will, um, will just not socialize with them. So there's a lot of stigma associated with it. There's a lot of um, attitudes that um, it's just pe people can just be quite um, uh, exclusionary and, and just stay out of the way of someone who has some kind of disability. So often what that can, can do is that the child with the visual impairment can often then not be exposed as much to friends and to um, lots of social contact simply because it's hard for them to be in social groups with people who um, do not have disabilities. So in, um, they have difficulty initiating contact. A child with a visual impairment will have difficulty playing with some other child. They can't do the usual um, games and um, hide and seek and riding bicycles and all the things that a, an, a visually competent child would do. So there's a lot of um, other difficulties that go with these, these sensory impairments. And uh, because of their physical activity being restricted, their movements being restricted, they're not able to keep up play ball and um, do the games that other children are, are playing. And often we know from research that children with any kind of disability are often excluded and they'll become lonely 
and they're not part of social groups. So if you do have any children with any kinds of visual difficulties in your group, your classroom, anywhere, please be aware of the implications of the visual impairment, the implications for their social and emotional well-being. These children often will become introverted and lonely simply because it is hard work to socialize and to be part of a social group when you are not able to see clearly and not able to see well with these, these people. Okay, so I want to go on and give you some guidance and some ideas about what to do as a teacher in a classroom for learners who have visual impairments. And the first thing is always early identification. And I think I've stressed that throughout this lecture. Earlier, the earlier we know of a problem, the better it is for helping the child somehow with that problem from a medical perspective and helping to get some kind of support for the child who is maybe the vision is deteriorating. How do we help this child in future and the family and the parents? So referrals to optometrists and referrals to the correct medical specialists is key to be done as early as possible. Ensure that learners wear their prescription glasses. If a child has been prescribed glasses to read, there is a reason for it. They will not be able to read clearly with out the glasses and often wearing glasses for children in itself is a problem because other children will bully them and tease them and give them names and labels about their glasses. Um, allow learners to sit in the classroom where it's most comfortable for them. Sometimes they'll want to be in the front where they can see clearly but a child with albinis albinism might want to be in the back in a dark corner if they're light sensitive. So be aware of what the difficulty is that the child has so that um, they can be seated in the correct place. We need to provide lots of emotional encouragement and um, support for them. Uh, and some of the things that we can do is obviously we modify the, um, the work that they get because it needs to be in a, in a way that they can see it. Uh, we can modify assessments, we can modify worksheets, we can modify textbooks. So these things are all available. Enlarged worksheets, clear fonts, sometimes um, one needs to change the color, um, yellow on black or whatever the color is, color contrast is that's good for the child. Is um, uh, one, one needs to just investigate for each child and see what, what is needed for that. So as um, educators, um, it's important for you to know that there are various different schools out there. We do have schools for children who are blind and we do have, um, those schools have very strict criteria about what kind of children will go come into them and they will have um, their referral processes. Remember that any referrals get done through the district of that particular school. So the districts are what um, controls the, the placement of children in any of the special needs schools. Uh, we have full service schools in, in the country and full service schools can accommodate children with mild and moderate impairments and um, they will also distinguish between learners who are partially sighted and those who are blind. So um, a child who is blind is usually needs to go to a school for the blind where they're going to be taught to use a white cane for moving around an orientation uh, where they will get um, a guide dog where they will get um, to be taught Braille, how to 
use your hands to read Braille. And so schools for the blind have highly specialized equipment in them. When a child is partially sighted and they don't need that specialized equipment, they can stay in a full service school um, as long as there are some accommodations like big fonts and magnifying glasses um, and whatever accommodations that particular child needs. So um, partially sighted learners are taught through their visual sense. So they, 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 they we, one, one tries to let them see as much as you can, whereas learners who are blind are being taught through their sense of touch and hearing. So they need to compensate for that. So there are a lot of different things that teachers can do, and I've given a whole list here. Um, real objects, and a lot of these things are good not only for children with visual impairments, but just good for children in general to, to, to um, think about. Um, we learn much better when we have the real objects to look at rather than a picture or some abstraction. Never assume that children know the concepts and things that we're talking about. Um, I will get to questions in a minute. When exploring new objects, um, there is a technique which um, people use for children who are blind called the hand under technique. So um, you, you place your hand under the child's hand and then you guide them as to what you want them to touch or feel or do. And please remember to read aloud what is written on the board. So if you are writing something on the board, don't read or speak what you are saying into the blackboard. Turn around and look at the class when you are speaking um, whatever you've written. Because a lot of children with visual impairments are doing lip reading. So they're looking at facial expressions in order to understand what is happening. And try, if you know you have a child with some kind of um, uh, visual impairment, make sure that your descriptions are nice and clear and your directions are, um, posters are clear and any visual information that you have that they, um, that they understand what it is. And then we have very specialized things like um, software, which is available on cell phones and computers that can um, convert texts into voice. So for someone who can't read the text, there is um, things that on, on our um, devices that can read that text for us. And these children can often be taught to do those kinds of things. Okay, when you have group discussions, um, it's important for a child who can't see faces of other children clearly that the child identifies themselves and they say who they are before they start speaking because the person with a visual impairment is relying on their ears, not just what the child visually looks like. Use contrast well and use comb color combinations that are best for the child and be aware of glare. So often the lighting in a room can be, um, cannot be good for children. So they, they might um, not want bright sunshine and things that are very bright and very dark places in a classroom. That's not good either. And then um, don't ask someone if they can see something. You need to ask them, what can you see? because then they'll be able to tell you what they see. Don't say, can you see this? Because they don't know what you're referring to often when they have a visual impairment. Okay, so I hope that that's given you, I've put a lot of information in a very small space of time, but I hope that that's given you a good indication of the range and the variety of different visual impairments that are out there and some of the things that we can do as educators to assist them.
Right, so I see there is a question on the chat. Let's get to that. And if you have any questions, please post them on the chat so that I can answer them. Um, so, uh, student Alexander wants to know, children with albinism struggle with sight, so it might benefit to sit them close to the front, but due to the fact that they are light sensitive, they can prefer to sit in a dark corner. How do you work around that? Okay, so often it's it, the, the principle here is individualization, so we ask the learner, where is best for you? And in some classes, they might want to sit in the front, and in others, they might want to sit at the back. And also remember that children with albinism should wear their hats inside classrooms and outside the classroom. So often, if they wear the hat, it also helps with the glare as well. Okay. Right. So I don't see any other questions. Can I please remind you, someone has. To has a question. Does someone has their hand up? Student Maja. Do you want to turn your microphone on? No, nope, not coming to speak to us. Can I please remind you to um, go to the tutor sessions with the tutor and please look at Blackboard. There are quizzes and there are assignments on Blackboard. Every unit has things that need to be done. And um, please, please, when you send an email, please send emails to the tutor first. If the tutor cannot assist you, then you can send emails to me. I'm getting email inundation with hundreds of emails coming through with queries about quizzes and things. The tutor is on Blackboard. Uh, she's able to assist you. She's able to help with most of the queries. And if she can't help you, she will then escalate to me. So please, can you first email the tutor and then email me with these things? Okay. so. Thank you very much, everybody. That has been a long session. I know it's a lot of work, but I hope that you have some idea now that will stand you in very good stead as you go into your teaching practice.